world. Well, the real world, actually. Yeah, yes. that's a good point. Yeah, thankfully. So the acclamation, uh, I just put it in the bulletin here, so we don't have to page flip so much. Surely the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Let's pray to call it for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires desire known, known, and from and you no secrets are hid. Cleanse, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. You can flip back a couple pages to page 100 for the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honor your father and your mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not murder. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet. Lord, Lord have mercy upon us, and write all these your laws in our hearts, we beseech you. We have an Advent hymn, Prepare the Way, O Zion. This is hymn 13.
of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We have a seat for the readings. We begin with a reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not your iniquity forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Along those lines, we turn to Psalm 80 on page 374. The first seven verses give us the tone of this prayer. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead Joseph like a sheep. Show yourself also, you that sit upon the cherubim. For four, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us again, O God. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be whole. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people that pray? You feed them with the bread of tears, and give them plenteous tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh to scorn. Restore us again, O God of hosts. 
Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be whole. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians, very beginning, chapter 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. As we prepare for the Gospel, we can turn to hymn 26. With similar language to what we've already read and heard. O Savior, rend the heavens wide.
The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory Glory to you, Lord Lord Christ. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, you, Lord Lord Christ. Christ. Please have a seat. Well, welcome to Advent. Um, This is the beginning of the church year as we follow the life of of Jesus uh, throughout the course of the the liturgical time. Uh, Advent is as we prepare for his Advent, obviously, (laughs) and hence the name, but his Advent, his coming, his arrival. But of course there are two of those, so Advent takes on at least a double meaning. Um, There is the first Advent of Jesus, as a baby in the flesh, uh, in um, you know, Jerusalem and Nazareth, and that whole story long ago. There is, of course, the second advent of Jesus that we are watching out for. And so, even though we've got you know some Christmas-like decorations beginning to appear um, as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, we're also taking on this other layer of preparation. Stay awake. Keep watch. I think, uh, I think in this in this short bit of this gospel text, we heard "stay awake" three times. I wasn't counting for sure, but you know, it, it's a it's a very prominent theme in the final teachings of Jesus before his um, death and resurrection. So we have this call to be awake, this call to pay attention, this call to persevere. And this is especially uh, pertinent, I guess. I mean, it's, it's pertinent every year, um, but, uh, you know, Christmas time and the time leading up to Christmas is already a very distractible time. Um, the flurry of end of the year stuff, uh, especially for those uh, you know, t- taking care of the accounting or the finances for an organization and you know, get, get the year-end stuff together. Time to get the, the, the parties, the food, the presents, and all the you know, <coughs> social occasions that normally take place. Lots of things to distract us. And then every four years we're reeling from an election or the results of an election or the not yet results of an election. And... Uh, there's so many things at the end of the year this time that easily distract us. So it, it's really helpful that Advent steps in at the exact same time and says, Stay awake! Keep watch! Um, cast away the works of darkness and put upon yourself the armor of light. I'm quoting from that collect that I read, but that's from uh, Romans chapter 13. So... That would be the traditional epistle for this day as well. So I just wanted to sort of highlight some things about the Advent, what it looks like 
for God to appear. Not just in his physical and permanent return at the end of the stage, but even in the course of, of our spiritual lives. So we have from Isaiah... <laughs> there's room, you can sit. We have from Isaiah this uh, sort of progression. It's almost like a psalm. You know, psalm 80 was very similar to it, but uh, most of this in Isaiah 64 is basically a sort of prayer. It's Isaiah addressing God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. So this is a longing for a theophany, an appearance of God. Uh, there are several of these in the Old Testament, and quite frequently uh, they are accompanied with whirlwinds and great earthquakes and fire and noise, uh, and the people tend to be quite terrified. Um, you can think of Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus as one of the great examples of this. There are a couple psalms that describe this sort of thing as well, and you can see this also in the, one of the famous stories of Elijah the prophet. There is fire and earthquake and wind and stuff, and, but the Lord is not in any of those until he hears the voice at the end. And depending on how you translate it, it's either a still small voice or a booming powerful voice. But either way, it's a voice, and that's the key. So all the natural phenomena, whether they're, you know, being played up for effect or whether they're historically descriptive, either way, they are pointing us to the reality of the presence of the Lord, which is a huge deal and very uh, disruptive to the natural order, which has been tainted by sin. So we're seeing this in Isaiah, this description that you would come, rend the heavens, apparently he has to rip his way through space to get here, and, you know, when, like, just like how fire kindles brushwood and boils water, he makes his name known, and you know, people quake, the mountains quake. Uh, so this is no small thing being asked for the presence of the Lord, which perhaps should give us pause to thought when uh, perhaps, uh, it, well, not that this happens in this particular congregation, but sometimes people have a tendency to pray that, that the Holy Spirit would come down and be with us as we... Uh, approach him in worship, but you know, if we think seriously about what it means for God to come down and, and be with us in person, that might be a little bit more terrifying than usual. But it's not all terror, and this progression helps identify this. So that is, so we have this appeal for God to appear, and that he would, and the implication is that he would appear as a judge. Uh, that you would make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence, going, oh boy, he's real. Mm. And we have a problem. So that problem is beginning to be, ex will, will be um, explored, but first, verses 4 and, and beginning of 5, reflect on God himself. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. So God is unique. He is the God, the only God, the true God. And he meets him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember him in his ways. So there is a special presence of the Lord with his people, with people who pursue righteousness and remember God. Uh, and re remember is usually a technical term. In Hebrew, well, not technical, but in a, it, it's a term in Hebrew and, and Greek, especially, uh, where where it's not just recalling things in your mind; it's doing something to you know commemorate or bring about the uh, ratification or reality of something already known or something past. So, to remember God in your ways would be, you know, to you know either be doing some act of worship or some other intentional work uh, in the name of the Lord. For example, Holy Communion is a remembrance of the death of Christ. It's not just us going through what we remember, because we don't remember it. We weren't there. <laughs> but the church remembers, and we memorialize it, or make a remembrance of it, in this rite that we call Holy Communion. Many of the offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament were called memorials, memorial offerings, memorial sacrifices. So we 
So those who remember God in their ways are people that God is particularly near to. So this is a God of righteousness, a God of holiness. And so we get to the inevitable result of this in the verses, uh, second half, half of verse 5, as well as verse 6. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. <laughs> what a surprise. Um, in our sins we have been a long time. And who? And shall we be saved? This is an honest question. We're sinners. We don't deserve the presence of the Lord. And if he did come down among us, we would probably be burned to a crisp. Shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, which is, again, a, te a technical term. Someone who is not allowed to come near God in that context. We have all become like that. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. So what about all those people who do good things? Sorry, their righteous deeds are like polluted garments without faith and repentance. And this is true not just for those outside the church, but for us as well. We all mix sin into our, uh, into our works frequently. And so he, he finishes this section, we all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So if we're so easily blown away in the wind of our own sins, imagine the whirlwind of the presence of the Lord. <laughs> There'll be nothing left of us if he were to show up. And Isaiah continues in his um, concern. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. So all this imagery to highlight the reality of sin and the reality of what it means to be a fallen person. And it's not exciting, it's not good news, it's not what we want to hear, uh, unless you have a particularly self-effacing sense of spirituality in which you go, yes, that is exactly me, and I have no idea how I'm being saved. I think Martin Luther was like that, judging by his temperament and the great hope that he had in the gospel when it finally clicked for him. Very, it's a neurotic guilt, as you said, as, as, as it's called. Some people are guilty uh, because you know they've sort of been convinced to feel guilty. Yeah, you know, but this is a, a more of a there is no way out of this. I am stuck here. Sort of sense of reality of understanding of sin. Please don't push with him. Please don't push him. But now he prays at the end of this little section. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. Well, there is a change of pace. We are the clay, you are our potter, we are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. So there is a prayer of hope here. He knows that even though we are so fallen apart, so helpless, so easily blown away, yet we are children of God. He, Isaiah has the audacity to call God his Father, and the father of all Israel in this, in this context, and to, and to acknowledge that we are clay in his hands. This image of clay in the hands of the potter shows up a few times in the Bible. Paul takes it up in some of his epistles as well. And it's this sense of hope at the end that God can remake us, reshape us. We might be entirely broken and easily blown away right now, but things can be changed. He can transform us. And so we responded in the psalm. There's that recurring line in Psalm 80, Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts, uh, that we may be whole. Uh, so there is this sense of hope, this reality that salvation is offered by God and worked by God himself upon those who are near to him and brought near to him. That's kind of what Paul in 1 Corinthians is referring to as well. Uh, that you, know, you, you know, the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you, that, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the sort of Advent reality right there, that they're awaiting the last day, and they are, have all the gifts they need as they wait for Christ, who will sustain them to the end. Guiltless. 
And that's saying something, because if you, you may recall, 1 Corinthians has a lot of things to say about the guilt and problems in Corinth, about their sexual problems and their obsession with Gnostic wisdom and knowledge and some of them denying the resurrection of the dead and all this stuff. And yet, guys, Harold? No. Really? Too much noise. Guiltless. He still says that Christ is going to preserve them guiltless, despite all the problems that he's about to outline for them. So we have this sense of hope and this encouragement that although things are pretty bad, not just in the world around us, but within us ourselves, God is here, daring to bust through the heavens and shake the world to make us new. Oh, okay, this is not a good idea, kids. <laughs> But this is but this is gospel. This is the good news that we are here. We can still come and call God our Father. We can still be gathered together and be made whole, be healed, be forgiven, and transformed. And so that's one of the big things about this Advent season is this chance to make a New Year's resolution. I know that's a sort of a flippant thing, and for in many cases, I. I I think I only know like one person who, who's serious about making New Year's resolutions and makes goals and how to accomplish them and checks in throughout the year and evaluates at the end. Maybe she doesn't anymore. Uh, I don't know. But this is the kind of thing that we can consider, especially at this time of year. Um, what resolutions? How, how are we going to tackle our sins? How are we going to cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light? Um, sometimes that means making a new plan for charitable giving. Oh, how convenient that charity is a major cultural theme still leading up to Christmas. That's handy for us. Maybe we can make use of that. Uh, but there's also the call to pray and the call to invest in who God has called us to be. So, Advent, a fresh start with a God of new beginnings. Let us stand and declare our faith with the words, in the words of the Nicene Creed. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen.